include partners in the matter of Commission on Foundation Revenue and Customs and Bank of Commission for Five LLC? Yes, Mr. Yates. Uh, well, oh, before Mr. No, no, Yates sorry. gets on his feet, may I just very briefly <coughs> recap as to where I hoped to be at the close of play yesterday on my unallowable purposes? Yes, of course. And I, I was going to put them down as numbered propositions. Please don't be frightened by the fact that there are 15 of them. They are very, very short, each of them. So is this sort of pulling together? Yes, All trying right. to pull together in, a, in an organised way when maybe yesterday I was less organised. No, you were, you, were, you were taken, you were, you were distracted and taken off. I was off pulled from... hither and thither, but in any event, <laughs> I'm hoping now to pull those together. Sorry, yes. just so as not to distract you when yes. you go through your 15, can, yeah. I, can I just clarify one very minor point? Yeah. You said right at the start of the hearing that what, I think the early periods were not covered by Tiopi, because yeah. that applies to periods commencing on or after 1 April 2010. But as far as I can see from the tribunal decision, the first period that's in dispute is an accounting period ending in November 2010. Have I missed something? I appreciate the loans were put in place earlier. I thought that that very first period was in dispute well. Well, that's not what the decision no. said. Well, and the, okay. And the, and the right. closure notices and the right. funds all seem to okay. start into a... It may be... It may be that the answer to that is this. I've got that wrong because although the loans were entered into in 2009, it may be that interest was only paid in 2010 and this was, as the law stood at the time, a connected party relationship where... Anyway, could some... I, I'm, yeah, I will I check that. We, we need to proceed on the basis... Mr. Yates thinks I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> can okay. I leave that one with him as well when he makes his abortion? Can, can that be clarified, please? Because I don't yes. think it's what the tribunal no, is. Fine. Yeah. Thank you. So, we've, got, we've got the closure notices. Yes. The first closure notice end, ends 30th November 2010, mm. counting period. 30th November 2010, ending. Right, ending 2010, and therefore beginning in the period when the loans were entered into. Yes. But you need to fit that in with the commencement decision to be the office. Right, that's what we want. Right, you're now going to My give us very uninterrupt, 15 uninterrupted um, propositions. Um, they don't have to be uninterrupted. If no, I think we'll, what we'll do is we'll come back to them at the end if we want right, to interrupt. Thank you very much. So number one is section 442. So I'm focusing first of all on 442 and unallowable <coughs> purpose. And then my second set of submissions, amongst those 15, will be to do with 441 and the apportionment question. So 442 refers to the purposes for which the company is a party to the loan relationship. It is not referring to other purposes, such as the purposes for which the company is party to wider arrangements. And that is the travel document service case. Remember, I took you to those paragraphs where Lord Justice Newey said, we're not concerned with why the company entered into those other transactions as well to get the tax advantage. Nor is it concerned with the purposes for which the company was created. Those, those purposes for which the company was created, by definition, are not the company's own purposes. They cannot be. I mean, they, may, they may well cast light on the company's own purposes, but are not themselves the company's purposes. Proposition two. The purposes for which the company is a party to the loan relationship are the company's own purposes. Even as a matter of if as a matter of interpretation, section 442 can be concerned with other persons' purposes, and this is the point that Lord Justice Nuji made yesterday. It is and always has been common ground in this case that we're only concerned with LLC 5's purposes. Proposition 3. A company's purposes are a subjective matter, and that was Travel Document Service, paragraph 41. Proposition 4, given that a company is a legal fiction, it's necessary to identify its subjective purposes by reference to the subjective purposes of the natural persons who are acting on behalf of 
and taking decisions for the company. Proposition five, in general, those natural persons are the company's board of directors. I say in general, unless the board have been bypassed or are acting on someone else's instructions. Proposition six, the mere fact that the board receive and follow advice from another person does not make any difference. In other words, the person, the purposes of the person giving that advice are not to be attributed to the company simply because they are giving advice to the board. <clears throat> Proposition seven, in identifying the subjective purposes of the board, the approach in Malaleu and Drummond is not applicable. In other words, in this context of section 441 and 442, the mere fact that an inevitable consequence of being a party to the loan relation <coughs> is that a deduction is available cannot be a reason for saying that the company's board must have had a purpose of obtaining that deduction. That's Proposition 7. Proposition 8 is the FTT found as facts, one, that the board of LLC5 had a commercial purpose for entering into the loans, and two, that they left the tax advantage out of account. And they left the tax advantage out of account because they were advised to do so, given that it could be of no benefit to the Proposition 9, the upper tribunal erred in holding at paragraph 162 of its decision that in identifying LLC 5's subjective purposes in being a party to the loans, the FTT was entitled to look beyond the subjective purposes of the board. Both of the upper tribunal's reasons for so holding are wrong. The first reason, given at paragraph 104, Sorry, 164. 164. Was it in following the advice by Mr. Fleming that the tax advantage should be left out of account, the board was circumscribed and not free to decide for itself. This is wrong because of my proposition six, which was the mere fact <coughs> that the board receive and follow advice from another person doesn't matter. The second reason given by the upper tribunal at paragraph 165 was that the anti avoidance <coughs> legislation would be undermined if you attribute to the company the board's deliberate decision to leave the tax advantage out of account. This is wrong because the upper tribunal overlooked that that decision was a perfectly reasonable and not an artificial one, given that, as I've mentioned, LLC 5 could not benefit from tax advantage. <coughs> Proposition 10, if applying section 442, you determine, sorry, I'm now moving on to section 441, because the rest of my submissions are about 441, <coughs> the attribution test. If in applying section 442, you have determined that the company's purpose or one of its purposes is an un unallowable purpose, then section 441 requires you to determine objectively the causal effect, or if you like, the consequences of that unallowable purpose. Proposition 11, therefore, section 441, like 442, is only concerned with the company's purposes, not with another person's purposes. 12, if the company also has a commercial purpose, and because of that purpose, it would have been a party to the loan relationship, even in the absence of the unallowable purpose, then the unallowable purpose has no causal effect or consequence. And this is a point which is discussed by Lord Justice Newey in Travel Document Service at paragraphs 50 to 54. He decided 
that there was no or insufficient evidence in that case that the company would have done what it did anyway for commercial reasons. But he appeared to accept in principle that that was the approach you should adopt by asking what would have happened in the absence of the tax purpose. <coughs> Can the company prove that it would have had those same debits anyway? Proposition 11, uh, 13, the section 441 test involves asking a hypothetical question. Would the company still have been a party to the loan relationship? Would the amount of interest be the same, have been the same in the absence of the unallowable purpose? 14, in applying section 441, the FTT applied an objective approach not a subjective one. Now, although at paragraph 123 of its decision, the FTT posed this question in terms of the evidence of Mr. Cushell is that the LLC5 would have entered into the loans even if there had been no tax advances. So that's the way it put it in terms of the evidence of Mr. Cushell. We know that the FTT accepted the evidence of Mr. Cushell, so that by referring to his evidence in my submission, the FTT is making its own finding of, of fact as to objectively what would have happened in the absence of the tax purpose. And then Proposition 15, therefore, in interfering with the FTT's Section 441 decision, the Upper Tribunal erred in two respects. First, at paragraph 191, for criticising the FTT for applying a subjective approach, I've explained that it didn't do that. Secondly, at 194, by holding that Section 441 is concerned with, or can be concerned with, another person's that is, in bringing LLC5 into existence. So that my submission putting them together is 442 is concerned with the company's purposes, or at least it is in this case. You don't move away from the company's purpose um, when you then ask to, to what extent, if you found an unallowable purpose of the company, that, as consequences, you're still concerned with that same purpose and its cause and effects. You don't move away from that and ask a totally different question. <coughs> why did the company, why was the company brought into existence? So those are my 15 submissions. I'm very happy to take questions on those, or I could do that in my reply. Um, but subject to that, can I ask if Mr. <coughs> Yates could give some submissions? And these would be on, on the assumption that Yes, there is an unallowable purpose for some reason. Um, my submission this is the numbers. I think the it's sort of the all numbers. about the apportionment. Now. Yeah. It's about apportionment, exactly. And we better hear about that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Yates. Uh, thank you. Um, so, just, just in terms of um, background, in terms of detailed submissions on numbers and apportionment, there were none before the FTT. Obviously, the FTT allowed the debits in full, um, and there were no detailed submissions either way on a halfway house. No, it was all or nothing. It was all or nothing. In front of both tribunals. Uh, well, in front, that's the result in, in front of both tribunals. In the upper tribunal, there were submissions made on apportionment um, on a numerical basis, and you can find those uh, summarised by the upper tribunal at paragraphs 188 to um, 189. But they went all or nothing in the end. They went all or nothing, they went the other way, exactly. Thank you. All right, shall we look at 188? Yes, let's do that. So that's core tab 6, page 132. <coughs> and if I can just invite um, you to read so 188 to 190. Thank you.
just for reference, the constructive tax purpose, which is referred to in paragraph 188, that's the Malibu point. It's not the uh, other means by which the upper tribunal determined purpose, because th that was obviously known at the time. And you can see those uh, disposed of by the upper tribunal at uh, paragraph 197 on the following page, 133. Those um, alternative submissions are essentially made again in, before this court, and just again for your note, um, in, in the party skeletons in, the, in LLC 5, they are in 105 to 110. <coughs> That's in core bundle tab 2, pages 42 to 43. And the revenues response is at paragraph 79 to 82 of their skeleton. That, that is in core bundle tab 4, page 80. Now, obviously, the primary position of LLC 5 is that the um, first year tribunal got it right and there should be no disallowance on the just and reasonable apportionment. So, what I'm um, submitting to you is first of all, we have to assume that, that there is both a tax and a commercial purpose, otherwise, you don't have to engage with an apportionment exercise. Um, so, that, that's, the, that's the assumption behind these submissions. And there are just three documents I'd just like to take you to before I make those submissions, if I may. The first is, is the board minutes, and you can find those in the supplementary bundle at tab 17, and in particular, uh, I'd like to go to page 319, <coughs> and if you have that, you see there's a... Um, Passage, second paragraph, Mr. Fleming updated the board on the UK debt cap rules, which were being introduced for accounting periods beginning on or after 1st of January 2010, which potentially restricted <coughs> UK tax deduction for interest costs. There's a brief description of the rules. But th those rules were, in were introduced and they did come into force. Uh, and essentially, what they do is I'm not going to spend the small amount of time allotted to me trying to explain them, but what they essentially do is prevent. A, a UK part of a group, a worldwide group, from having interest costs in excess of the actual worldwide cost. So you, you can't create an internal debt, have large amounts of interest when the actual um, total costs of the group are lower than that. that. That's what that's referring to. And if you look a bit further down, um, so this is fourth paragraph, EY had concluded that after the acquisition. Do you see that paragraph? Yes. Three lines. From the bottom, the structure would give rise to interest deductions between 50 and 70 uh, million per annum, with a larger interest deduction of uh, 29 million December 29, since the debt cap rules were not in effect during that month. Do you see that? And that's the, when we come onto our skeleton, what we've done in, in terms of taking the anticipated tax deduction is to take the midpoint, just to say 60. That's just the midpoint between 50 and 70. So that's the first document that I wanted to take you to. Right, so they thought it would save them 60. They thought they would get uh, a deduction of 60. Right. So nothing like the, um, the, the interest, which was actually arising on the, on the, on the loan. Um, LLC 5 then actually submitted returns on that basis. And if you stay in uh, supplementary, um, supplementary bundle and turn to tab 1, could I ask you to turn, this is the statement of agreed facts before the tribunal, can I ask you to turn to page 7 and paragraph 25. Yes. And you'll see there that it's just a, an agreed, a series of agreed facts about what actually happened. And LLC 5 um, did operate the debt cap. And you can see the effect of that debt cap over the page, paragraph 26. You see a table there. The, the top line is dollars. The, the bottom line is well, bottom set of figures are pounds. Let's, let's just stick with dollars. You can see that the vast majority of the of, of the debits were going to be disallowed under under the debt cap, and they were returned on that basis. So, in fact, the 
the deduction claimed was lower than what was anticipated. For example, in the year 31st December 2011, you can see a figure of 12. What then happened was, um, you can see a paragraph 27, BlackRock, BlackRock realized that it wasn't going to be within the debt cap rule. And you can see that set out of paragraph 27. Uh, and the reason why is there was a gateway test, which essentially said if you're below 75% of the earnings <coughs> um, for the worldwide group, you just don't have to apply these rules. And the reason why they didn't meet the gateway test um, was all to do with the treatment of fixed income securities, which you can see there to, um, in, in terms of policyholders. That's treated as external debt. Exactly. And, and, and that, that fed into the, there's a gateway test in what was, it now being repealed and replaced with another set of rules. Um, that was in section 261 of TILPA. And the relevant definition of relevant liabilities is set up <coughs> in section 264. And it was just that BlackRock misunderstood initially how that, that those liabilities to policyholders would be treated. Because ultimately, the way these rules worked was it wasn't a legal analysis per se. It was all done on the basis of accounting treatment. And so you took a worldwide group, not on a sort of corporation tax understanding of a group. You, you, you took a consolidated accounts as it was understood from an accounting perspective. And it was all to do with the accounting treatment of this debt and treatment of it. And there was simply they a- They seem to have been quite lucky because one wouldn't have imagined that debts payable on fixed income securities to policyholders were intended to count as external debt for the purposes of the rules. But but Happily, my lord, I don't have to address you on that because yes. uh, the revenue agreed. Yeah. You can see the revenues agreement there, at paragraph 28. Yeah. So from January 2014, both the revenue and BlackRock were in agreement that the worldwide debt cap rules didn't apply. So that's, that's the second document I wanted to take you to. The last document is just, again, in supplementary bundle. This, t this time it's at um, tab 16. <coughs> and it's just a single... Um, single page. And this is the free cash flow analysis, which is referred to in the board paper. So this was before the board? This was before the board. Hmm? Yeah. And why, why am I referring to this? If you look at the figures um, for free cash flow, and free cash flow after interest and expense. Starting with the 2010 um, figure, you can see that those flow into the table at the back of the skeleton argument uh, for LC5, which is the basis for our, our first alternative submission. So if, if this is really just a where do we get the figures from, if you see at page 44 of the bundle with our uh, skeleton core bundle, page 28 of the skeleton itself, you can see those figures are replicated essentially within the um, analysis put forward there. And I'm looking at the, the free cash flow figures and then I'm looking at the free cash flow after interest expense. So those are the only three documents which I, I need to take you to in order to make these submissions. If we just turn to the um, if we just turn to LLC5 skeleton, the, the two submissions um, which are made essentially propose two alternative apportionments. The first is to compare... Right, so we are paragraph 105. Right? We are paragraph 105, and in fact, figures, when we get to it, are over the page at 107. Yeah. And, and you can uh, I would <coughs> say is, there is a small degree of arithmetic, but common to both... Um, sets of apportionment. The AT figure, that is the midpoint between 50 and 70, which you can see in the board paper, that's the 60 million. That's common to both sets of apportionment. And the denominator differs. In the first alternative, um, what we're doing is comparing the anticipated tax advantage, so the debit, the anticipated debit of 60, and then comparing it with the anticipated commercial advantage, which is the free cash flow figures. And you can see that is um, over the page explained in a table, which I don't think I have to take you through now. Um, and that's 
where you ultimately end up with an average of 9.25%. <coughs> and the logic of that is, if you're comparing or trying to weight two purposes, one is the tax advantage purpose, one is the commercial purpose, let's assume the board had both in their mind, then when you're coming to a just and reasonable apportionment, the obvious thing to do is, to, if they both have cause and effect, is to try and weight them. That certainly would be open to this court in my, yes. my submission to, to weight them. And the weighting is, as you can see, very much in favour of the commercial, uh, the yes. commercial purpose. Because this was a great deal for LRC5. It was essentially getting this massive cash flow in the form of dividends up um, via the preference share. So on your first approach, pure economic analysis, what came to the most? Yes. Uh, relative value of the be, be, advantage, which by the way we don't admit. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and the overall financial. And, and, and that is ultimately reflecting the fact that this was part of a commercial acquisition. This wasn't a tax scheme. This, there was some tax planning involved, that's not denied. But the tax planning as well has to be understood in the fact that BlackRock genuinely believed that this worldwide debt cap was going to apply. And so whatever tax advantage there was going to be was, right. was going to be severely constrained. So can we come fairly swiftly to the second? Fairly swiftly to the second. The second one's um, much simpler. That's simply looking at the anticipated tax deduction, 60 again, over the anticipated debits, so the total debits, which were arising on these... Um, uh, arising on, on these loans. And again, according to that um, Duff and Phelps free cash flow analysis, the, the forecast debits were going to be 205 million. And so, again, we, we say if you're going to disallow um, debits which are attributable to the tax, <coughs> tax purpose, um, it, it makes sense to only disallow those which were actually anticipated. Okay. Uh, I, and that's the submission. Thank, thank you for that. I'm, I'm quite anxious that we don't go over 11 o'clock. Um, but can I just confirm? All of this is hypothe hypothesized on the basis that it matters at all uh, what you thought you were going to get. Indeed. Right. And so if the answer is it doesn't matter at all, um, then we don't get into this. Th that's very true. Yeah. Right. So it's all anchored um, in, um, in, in your own subjective um, expectations about what your dealings would produce. Indeed. But of course, you're, uh, what's feeding into this, you're only into apportionment in the first place if you've already established what exactly. those subjective intentions are. And this is exactly. Just but so it's, it goes back to the discussion I had with Mr. Prosser yesterday, which is where subjective ends and objective begins. Well, indeed. But this is... this. It's assuming in, in your favour that what you hoped this would achieve has got anything to do with it. Well, yes, but that is an objective fact. As well, well, the fact the fact that you that you hoped that you were going to get this is an objective fact. You would characterise it. It, it. It's nothing to do with the purpose. It's simply how would you appraise at day one what what that purpose, what what monetary value was attributable to that purpose? And yes, that's all done on forecasts, etc. But to say it's entirely subjective, it's not just what Mr. Cashel thought. It's what the board believed on. on through a combination of both ta external tax advice and the Duff and Phelps analysis. So it's, it's not just on a whim, a subjective whim. It is grounded in you know, objective reality in, in that sense, right. a, a, as far as human beings at the time could predict the future. I've got that. Thank you. Is, is, there, is there a question of interpretation of the statute or what? <coughs> um, what we have to do is, is produce, a, if we get to this stage, a just apportionment. It's just a reasonable portion. Just a reasonable portion. We'll send it back. But you say that it's a just and reasonable portion effectively between two subjective purposes. That, that, that is... And, and you say don't look beyond those. If yes. Subjective ones. Once we're in this territory, the submission is in you're only in here, you're only into a portion where you've got two competing subjective purposes. How do you weigh them? Now, a just and reasonable apportionment in the legislation clearly gives a wide degree of discretion for the decision maker to, yes. to, to decide. Yes. And it doesn't stipulate a method. I'm not saying these are the only methods, but these are <coughs> methods based on what the what can be objectively demonstrated as being what the parties believed at the time. And, and that is clearly a, a reasonable way. It's not the only way for you to apportion, but it, it's certainly a, a, 
a, a rational one for you to, 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 to do it fairly. Uh, and that's ultimately what Parliament is given, given to the courts to decide. There's no method. Or is, they can is, is, is it implicit in that that you only get to this stage of satisfied that the way in which the tribunal was, is the upper tribunal, the way in which the upper tribunal dealt with it was impermissible? You only get you only get to this stage if you um, believe that the way the upper tribunal dealt with it was impermissible, and what's more that the FTT apportionment should be disturbed as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> Can I? Yeah. Just on one follow-up point, my Lady Justice Falcon, in terms of the commencement provisions. Yeah. Um, so the, the, all of the periods which we're looking at in terms of the chronology are, are at issue. I, I believe you're right, my lady, that it's, it's if I may say so, it's, it's 506 of TILOPA. And, and that, that refers to accounting periods ending after April 2010, not commencing. Okay. So, I got that Mr. Prosser, so, right, all I needed to establish is we are actually only looking at TILOPA. I believe there was a red herring with Churchill 28. Good morning. Yes, 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 we agree with that. Can I then begin by going back to the transaction um, and the genesis of it and, and, and what was behind the various um, parts of the transaction? Um, and I always find the best way to look at these is to look at a diagram. I don't know whether you can do it. There's a very helpful diagram actually behind the decision of the upper tribunal. Appendix 1, which sets out the various um, steps in a diagram. I think. <coughs> so, so what was happening here, we all know the genesis of this was that there was going to be an acquisition of um, BGI. <coughs> and, and this all is concerned with the acquisition of the American, the US part of the BGI group. There were separate acquisitions of um, within, the, within the overall transaction, separate acquisitions of the which I think are referred to in the decision. Um, and the question which arose early on, Mr Horowitz, I think, asked the question, you will have seen in the decision, in the first tribunal decision, he asked the question, well, where, where are we going to push down the debt? And, and what he meant by that was, everyone involved with international tax planning knows that when there's an acquisition like this, that there will be debt pushed down through, the, through companies. And the question was, where can we locate that in order to pick up a, <coughs> the best tax uh, result? Uh, and the answer which they came up with was the UK, um, because it was thought that the UK had a, had a generous tax regime for uh, interest debits. Um, and so there had to be a UK resident company in the chain in order to obtain the debits. Uh, and, and that was orig very originally Incorporated and resident company, but it's quite soon realised <coughs> um, that, that that might be a problem uh, in America, in the US, uh, in particular in relation to the check the box provision. I'll, I'll just I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and so, and so what they decided to do was to have a, a a Delaware, I think, or a US anyway LLC, as all the other companies were in this particular chain. That is LLC 5. However, it would be resident in the UK by virtue of management control being exercised in the UK. So they had to have the board meetings in the UK. Um, <coughs> so there was a, although it was a US corporation, it was a UK resident. Um, <coughs> now you might think, well, why is this helping? Because um, if you pay interest from LLC 5 to LLC 4, surely it will be taxed in LLC 4. Therefore, you're not achieving anything. Um, but the, the, the trick here is uh, the, the US check the box provisions. Um, and, and what you're able to do is uh, by either checking the box or not checking the box, I can't remember which way around it is, but one way around or another, you can, for US tax purposes, 
LLC 5 and LLC 4 are treated as the same entity. And therefore, transactions between LLC 5 and LLC 4 have no tax consequences in the US. I think both were checked so that the, uh, yeah. strictly all the transactions were treated as by DFM and K. Yes, I mean, you're right. Um, in other words, the loan was ignored. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're right. But, but as far as uh, just concentrating on the, these two yeah. companies, they were treated uh, as, as a single entity or, or part of a larger entity. Um, and the idea being a debit would be available in the UK in LLC 5, but there would be no tax in LLC 4 because the interest payment is a nothing as far as the US is concerned. So that, that's the, if you like, the, the inwardness of, the, of that transaction. <coughs> um, a further problem was, was identified, a potential problem, uh, with having a UK company in, the, in there. I think there were two possible problems. One was the, uh, the UK controlled foreign companies legislation. And, and the concern was that in some way, the, the, if, it, if it controlled the subsidiaries below it, then the legislation could apply. <coughs> um, I think to be fair, the, the main concern was, was simply the administrative burden of dealing with it rather than perhaps actual tax liability. Uh, and, and I think there was also a regulatory concern in the US um, but anyway, because of that, you, we have this rather unusual, very unusual structure, whereby LLC4, which is the lender, controls LLC6. And LLC5 doesn't control LLC6, but has preference shares, which give it a preferential right to dividends. But it, it doesn't control the flow of these dividends, or indeed the flow of dividends further down the chain, or indeed control in any way the companies further down the chain. And of course it's that feature of the transaction which has introduced the transfer pricing problem in this case. If, if, if LLC5 had simply had no ordinary shares in LLC6, then we wouldn't be here on transfer pricing. We, we would be here on on a level purpose, but we wouldn't be here on transfer pricing because I, um, everyone would say that um, a, an independent lender would lend to LLC5 if it owned, controlled all the companies below it because it would be you know, extremely um, valuable. Um, so that, that, that's why the, the transfer pricing problem has arisen because of that very odd feature of this, of this transaction. Um, I, I say all that <coughs> um, and, and Partly because there, there's been some suggestion that the, the construction or the application of the annual level purpose legislation that we are suggesting could lead to the conclusion that any lending, you would lose the debits because you're aware that you would get the debits. But of course, that's not the case. This is an unusual transaction. It has features that have been specially crafted to take advantage of the debits rather than simply getting the debits incidentally to a, a lending transaction for a, for a commercial purpose. Um, the other point to make, of course, is um, <coughs> that the, the purpose of this chain is to ensure, is, to, is, is, is so that <coughs> profits which will be made, hopefully, in the BGI group will be passed up, um, up to um, the BlackRock group, which is beyond DFM Inc. in this diagram. And this was a point, and my learned friend referred to, this was a point that, that we made to the witnesses, which was, of course you knew that dividends were going to be paid up, because the whole point of this structure was that profits would be uh, dividended and uh, up, for, <coughs> partly by way of dividend, partly by way of loan, loan payments, up to the BGI group. So th there's no question that the group as a whole were in control of the dividend payment. That's never, we've in fact been part of the revenues case. Um, but, the, but the reason that they knew that the dividends were going to be paid up was because the group wanted them to be paid up, because that's the whole purpose in this, this chain to um, have dividends paid up. Without the, UK, without the attempt to take advantage in the UK, we wouldn't have the UK company, 
resident company, we wouldn't have the loan relationship. They would simply dividend the, dividend the payments up. So that, that's, that's <coughs> the reason for the crafting of the transaction, and that knew exactly how it worked. Uh, what I was proposing to do um, was to deal with the issues in the same order as my other friend did. So I was going to start with, with transfer pricing, if that's um, OK. Um, we come back to the on a level first. By way of introduction, transfer pricing, as its name suggests, is at its heart about pricing transactions, um, where we have what are known as controlled transactions, which means contractions, contract, sorry, transactions within a group of companies where there is overall control. The, the principle which is applied in the OECD um, guidance for achieving this is the arm's length principle. And one of the tools for achieving, um, for um, applying the arm's length principle is, is a comparability analysis. So what experts in transfer pricing will do is look at the actual transaction in the group, the control transaction, and then attempt to find comparable transactions in the real world um, in order to determine what the price would be of the control transaction if it took place in the real world. And that is what the 1995, the, the, the provisions in the 1995 guidance which we have in the bundle that's what they are all about. Um, and you can see that. If you um, turn up, it's, <coughs> it's tab 19 in the authorities bundle. Mr. Stewart, I find I find some of the terminology slightly confusing. When you say real world, you don't mean what actually happened. That's the actual transaction. No, I mean in the uncontrolled world. You mean in the uncontrolled world, yes. which is a, which is a, also a hypothetical world in, in a sense. And there wasn't a, a real uncontrolled transaction. But in our case, yes. there isn't one. I agree. But I'm, I'm talking. I'm, I'm looking at what the transfer pricing guidance is about. Because I'm, I'm, I'm cautioning you that when you read the paragraphs that have been been taken to slightly out of context. You've got to understand what the overall, what they're, what they're actually talking about, and why, why they, why it's there. So, what what people will will do is look for real transactions, uncontrolled transactions, which a are comparable. Actual, actual real transactions. Actual, actual uncontrolled transactions. Which are comparable to the actual controlled, controlled transaction. transaction. Yes. In order to determine what the price ought to be of the controlled transaction. Yes, I see. That's, all, that, that, that's, that's usually the, the search, because usually um, these transactions are not odd transactions like this one. Usually... Right, so what, 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 what we've got here is, um, uh, as you say, an odd transaction. Um, is it because of its size or because of the inserted UK element or both? Possibly both, but the most important part, I think, is because of the, the preference shares, because the borrower doesn't have control of the companies below. That's the oddity of this, this transaction as far as transfer pricing is concerned. Right, so it's not to do with the, um, the location issue. It's to, no. It's to do with, it could, it could be the same regardless of UK, US. Yes. That's not your point. No, the point's not, no, no, no not, okay. not in transfer pricing. No, it doesn't matter um, in this case. The point is it's relying on a dividend flow from the subsidiaries to pay the interest. It has no control over the dividend flow. It, it has no control. That's right. And, and, and jumping ahead, the, the experts agreed that, that no, no one at arm's length would enter into this transaction. No, no independent lender would lend $2 billion, whatever, to LLC4 in the situation that it Five. was in because, of, because it didn't have any control over the dividend flow. You said LLC4, but you Sorry, meant... Sorry, LLC5. Five. Five. They wouldn't lend to LLC5. So, we 
we're not looking we're not looking at an exercise where there are comparable transactions and you're trying to price transactions. This is a different exercise we're, we're engaged in. Um, but what I'm just trying to explain is what these guidance what these guidance are about. Um, so the comparability analysis is um, defined or explained on page six five six. There is a, there is a loss of gain. Six five five seems to be dated ninety eight. I, I saw we were, we were told these were ninety five. Right yes, maybe it may be that they were republished or something in, in ninety eight. Okay. <laughs> I think they were. I think they were originally ninety five by ninety eight. And they get, I don't think it matters. Um, so they talk about the arm's length principle. Um, in chapter one, um, what has happened since then is, uh, just as a, as a slight aside, um, there has been a lot of controversy about the arm's length principle and, and whether that is the most appropriate way of dealing with these kind of transactions, or is always the most appropriate way. And in the last ten or years or so, there has been what you might have seen referred to as BEPS, which is a, a project to try and deal with what they call. Um, Base erosion. It's essentially, they're trying to trying to they're trying to solve the problem as far as they can, so that, that profits are not being properly allocated. They say by the arm's length principle, so that you end up with profits in the wrong place or what they perceive to be the wrong place. And so there has been a lot of controversy about whether the arm's length principle is the, an appropriate um, method of doing this. In, in '98, that wasn't such an issue. When you come to the 2022 um, guideline, you will see quite a lot of very defensive sounding paragraphs about why the arm's length principle is an appropriate one. I think the context of that is because of all this criticism that's been happening. But the fact is that is the, that is the principle that is applied at the moment um, in transfer pricing. So whether it's whether it's controversial or not doesn't matter. Um, And another point to, to note is that transfer pricing is, is used by multinational corporations, not, not in relation to tax, but in relation to their commercial transactions between companies in the group. This is a point that's made on page 665 in the middle of paragraph 1.5, where it says, tax administration should be reminded that MNE, from a managerial point of view, have an incentive arm's length prices to be able to judge the real performance of the different profit centres. So that, that is done, not, not, not with tax in mind so much, but so that the company group knows where it's making its profits and that it's properly pricing transactions between the <coughs> companies. And, and Mr. Gaysford, in fact, said that his day job, most of his job, was actually dealing with transfer pricing in that context, not in a tax he would advise multinationals on how they should transfer price transactions between their own um, subsidiaries. So it's not just used in tax. And, and so we see the, um, <coughs> the comparability analysis beginning on page 670. where it says in 1.1.5, this is guidance for applying the arm's length principle of comparability analysis, reasons for examining comparability. And they say, for, in order for such comparisons to be useful, the economically relevant characteristics of the situations being compared must be sufficiently comparable. And, and they look at the various factors, characteristics of so the action. The, the phrase that keeps coming back is sufficiently comparable. Sufficiently comparable, yes. And that's all over this, isn't it? That, that is an exercise which we're not, we're not carrying out in this case. We, we know from the experts that there are no comparable transactions, nothing anything like this. That was their evidence. I'll take you to the, the findings, but that was the evidence for the findings. So, so what these guidelines are all about is how do you find comparable transactions in the uncontrolled real world? Um, 
and, and, and what factors do you take into account in determining whether they are comparable? Um, and things like risk, the allocation of risk in the transaction between the parties is a factor that you would take into account in determining um, whether these are comparable transactions. You, you might find in the controlled transaction that the risk is, 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 is in, a, in an unusual place, perhaps, compared to what it would be in a comparable <coughs> So you have to take account of all these kind of things. They, they talk about functional analysis. That's in paragraph 120 on page 672. Can you explain what those words mean? Uh, well, I think I think it's it's what they talk about in um, uh, 1.23. That probably tells you that comparing the functions. So you 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 compare what the what the different parties of the transaction are doing within the transaction, which includes the allocation of risk between them. So one of them might be manufacturing, and another might be wholesaling the goods. So they, they, they would manufacture, um, for instance, drugs. It's a typical um, transfer pricing dispute. Drug companies might have their, um, their factory to produce the drugs in Puerto Rico, for instance, and they might then sell them from that company to a wholesaler in the UK. And so the question is, what, what's the appropriate price for that transaction? Because otherwise, obviously, it makes a big difference to the tax in the UK, what the, what the, what the price would be. Um, so the risk comes in there, for example, because the Puerto Rican manufacturer may be just a contract manufacturer who isn't taking exactly. any risk on drug development. Yes. Or one of the examples I think was given, there's a number of examples in the, in the 2022 guidance of that, you may have a situation where the, the company which manufactures, although they own the factory, they, they don't control um, how the manufacturing takes place. The company that they're selling to actually controls that. And so they're, they're, um, they're not taking on the risk of, of um, the, the, the way that they actually operate not working. Um, so for example, they do that, that's the kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You're looking at the risk within the transaction and how it's allocated between the two parties. But this is all in the context of the um, um, finding comparable transactions and attempting to price the control transaction. Um, and indeed that's what the um, both the, <coughs> the first and second sets of um, the, the 2010 <coughs> guidelines are similar talking about As are the 2022 guidelines. <clears throat> so, I, I, as, I, as I said yesterday, I, I would like to um, rely on these guidelines. The, the only thing that I think you can get from them that's relevant is that there is no mention anywhere in these guidelines, no, sent, no suggestion in looking at um, hypothetical transactions at arm's length of introducing third parties into the transaction or the provision. Even when, even when there is a discussion of the possibility of covenants being given, it's by the borrower company. Well, I don't really understand this because presumably in real world transactions, these covenants can be given. By third parties. That, that's the nature, I'm, I'm afraid, of a lot of the arm's length principle, and one of the limitations of it. <coughs> it is limited to the transactional, we call it the provision between yes, the but if you're, if, if you're trying to do a, a real job, and in, in this instance, I appreciate, not this present case, compare what's happened here with what's happened in similar, sufficiently comparable cases, well, then there are going to be instances in which there are third party covenants in the original case and in the sufficiently comparable cases. So why, what, what warrant is there for saying um, that's out of bounds? Well, the warrant is, is, the, is the terms of well, our legislation, first of all. Right, so your argument devolves back entirely onto the two parties. My, my argument is based entirely on the UK legislation. Yes, yeah, all right. That's what we're looking well, for. Well, in a yeah. sense, that, that's not going to... I either suffer or get better by 
by repetition. That's 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 where it is. Yeah. Right. And and we have the extra dimension here, which you you pointed out, which is that um, an exercise was being carried out and was considered to be valid, even though there wasn't going to be found an industry comparable that um, uh, that worked for this particular transaction. Um, actually, I'm not quite sure what you. Well, I think I mean. The, 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 what you, in, a, in a common situation, as I've understood it, um, that you, you look at a transaction and then you'll find you look around and you'll find others that are regarded as being sufficiently comparable to be valuable to make a comparison. Right. But in this case, the experts weren't working with that because of the particular nature. No. Can I just clarify? I don't believe you are saying that um, the Chinese industry should be treated as comparable to the Chinese come up, the only way of performing a transfer party analysis is through a com comparability analysis. You must accept that that's not, no, that's I, not the case. Yes, I agree. Your point is rather that the guidelines that we were taking to be comparable. Yes, that's what they're about. Okay. Can I ask you a separate question? That the, earlier on in your discussion, you, you effectively said we wouldn't be here on transfer party were if LRC Yes. In, in yeah. um, but how then do you deal with the fact that an independent lender to LRC5 or any entity in the middle of a group of that nature, which is a, an intermediate holding company, would not just rely, say, lending for a billion on the unsecured covenant or, or even secured covenant? Well, that, if so, I mean, I do want to understand the yeah. ramifications of what you're saying. Well, we, we, we if, if that was the evidence and that, that transaction couldn't exist, then there would be a different case. Our understanding is that that wouldn't be the evidence and that wasn't. Well, it, it, it wasn't an issue, but we, it wasn't an issue because it didn't need to be. It doesn't arise on these facts, but we have to think about the implications. Yes, but we've never come, well, what, I'm, what I can tell you is that the, this is the way transfer pricing has been been done for decades and it hasn't caused us any problem. That, um, that's frankly and that's the, the, reven the revenue don't raise this sort of point when the assets are under the control of the exactly. borrower. Yeah. But, but you don't go further than that. Well it's not just they don't raise it because I, I, don't, I don't think that they're legally entitled to raise it because you have to look at the transaction between the parties under the legislation. That, that's the reason the revenue have taken their own view of it. No, it's, my, it's the my, reason point, that they, my point is a different one. You, it's, if you did do that analysis and you actually went to independent lenders and saw what they routinely would acquire, it wouldn't stay with the position of LLC. Well, that, 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 that's not the same, although I would be suspect saying that that transaction could not have taken place. What you're well, saying is, in practice, I don't want to get into evidence that we can't. Yes, exactly. But uh, I just want to say we do need to think about those sorts yes. of things. But my, my understanding is that that is a transaction that could take place. It, it may, in some circumstances, affect pricing. And that is accepted as part of mm. the arm's length test, I'm afraid. That, that is perhaps you might take one of those efficiencies. But the problem with the, the problem with the, the jumping of maths on the side of the head, the problem with saying, well, you can you can you can dream up any possible um, uh, third party interventions that you want, is, is that you then get into a situation where where you can find that, for instance, groups can say, well, our, we would have got you know um, a, a covenant or a security or whatever from, from our parents and their call. Well, uh, okay, we yes, it's, it's, there, we're not. That's one of the problems. Things. There also is a problem. I, I, I was asking a much narrower question, yeah. then, but then, then, yeah. let's move on. Yeah, so I, I recognise the point you're yeah. making, Lady. I think that's mm -hmm. is a is a valid point, but I, I, in my submission, it is the way that the arms length provision, the arms length um, <coughs> under transfer pricing works. 
it's not a perfect system, and everyone recognises it's not a perfect system. There is no perfect system um, for tenant leave. Um, but this is the way it works, both in the UK and, and internationally, under the, under the guidelines of, in my submission, recognise this simply by not discussing. Um, and, and if there was a possibility under, the, under, the, under transfer pricing of introducing a third party into the transaction, then there would undoubtedly be a lot of discussion about it in the guidelines because it would raise a lot of very complicated issues that would have to be resolved. Um. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> I, mean, the, the, I understand that the transactions would take place if the, if the borrower gives covenants that they will procure all these things to happen. So that, that's what they can, they can give if they have control. So that seems to be recognised. Transactions will take place probably on almost as the, <coughs> all the same terms as the actual transaction. Um. <coughs> <coughs> but it is important to look at it because this is a, this is a point of statutory construction, mm. and it's a question of looking at the UK yeah. legislation. So perhaps we could do that. If we just turn up section 147 on page 39. And so we say that we would say the starting point is the actual transaction, the controlled transaction between two parties. And that's one four seven one e. And then you ask the question under the legislation whether that the, the question relevant to this appeal. There are a number of questions you might have to ask. But the question you ask in relevant to this appeal is whether that provision would have been made between the two parties if they had been at arm's length. And it's recognised, as my learned friend explained, that the two parties remain the real two parties. What you do is you cut the, the um, connection between them. So they, they are so they're arm's length. And, and you ignore the fact that LLC4 is not in the business of lending money. It's a slightly, there's a slight fudge there, but that's the way Mr. my learned friend pointed that there is a provision which says something along those lines. And so you know, Lord Justice Nuji is right. What, what, the, what in practice is done is, is look in the, in, the, in the financial market to see if a bank or a financial institution would lend. That's what the experts did in this, in this case. They weren't looking for another company like LLC4 and asking whether it would, it would lend. Um, but, but the lending is to LLC5 in the position that LLC5 was in, in the group. And so if the answer to that question is that the provision would have been made, then there is no, no need to go any further in this case. There's no, there's no issue being raised about the price of the transaction. It, it would have happened. And there's no issue about of a thin capitalization sort. It's never been it's never been um, argued in that way. The taxpayer has never said, well actually it, it would have taken place if we put in so much equity and so much debt. So this is an all or nothing argument about whether this transaction would have Taking place <coughs> at arm's length. And the reason I say that um, you must look at the two parties still is, is the way that subsection <coughs> 1471D is worded. 
So the actual provision <coughs> differs from the provision which would have been made as between independent enterprises. And the independent enterprises referred to there are the are the two party, the two persons as independent enterprises, which are referred to in one A. So that, that's the transaction you look at. That's the provision that you look at. If you introduce <coughs> other parties into the transaction in the way that it was suggested here, <coughs> then, then that is not uh, the provision made between independent enterprises. What the independent enterprises refer to. There, there is another problem in this case, which is that the provision would not be provision by um, the other group companies would not be a provision between independent enterprises either because it would be providing uh, making a provision to LLC yeah but that's that, that's a bit of a distraction isn't it because that then becomes a question of classifying from that provision well no because it, it's, it's a question of whether it would come within this if you're asking is um, there has to be a provision between independent enterprises if you're introducing into the provision parties who are not independent enterprises of one other group company, then you're not doing what 1471D says. Your argument rests on t uh, the interpretation of D, doesn't it? I mean, you're not um, exactly yes. concerned with the interpretation of A for th this purpose. That's not the, the you you, no. you 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 ask a reading of D, which um, requires one to consider provision made as between independent enterprises to exclude the possibility that there is a third party involved in provision as between independent e enterprises. That's right, but I'm, I'm reading A and D together. Of course, but, because, but, yes. but I mean, yeah. the, the real heft of your argument points at D. Yes, but it's how, it's how D interacts with A is, is the important thing, because A is clearly about a, tr um, a provision between two persons, and as my learned friend said, that is being clearly decided and, and correctly that it is two persons means two persons. It doesn't mean more potentially. So it, it is an interaction between the two that, that we say that the independent enterprises must be the two persons referred to in A. But that's the whole point of the provision that it's cutting the cutting the group relationship. And <coughs> consequences in this in this, uh, or the potential, sorry, the potential consequences, or the potential questions, sorry, are in section 152, because as my learned friend said, this is a transaction um, which comes in 1452. <coughs> the, the factors that have been referred to in subsection 2. Um, in reading section 1471D are the differences between the actual and the arm's length transaction. That's what it's referring to when it talks about section 1471D is to be read as requiring account to be taken of all factors including, because these are all the differences, let's go back to 1D, between the actual and the arm's length transaction. A is whether the loan would be made at all in an arm's length transaction. And, that, and that's what we are concentrating on today. But there's also the questions of the amount of the loan and the rate of interest. It seems under sub two that in the real test is take account of all factors. Yes. And there are some inclusions. Yes, and, the, and one of them is, is is whether the loan would be made at all, and that's what we're focusing on in this case. That's the that's the factor. We're not focusing on the amount of the loan or the rates of interest. And, as, and, and, and putting up for your comment, in fact, it seems to be very widely drafted. It's what one is to take into account in, um, in applying one four seven one seven one D. Yes. Well, there there, there are there are. <coughs> It envisages there might be other things, although it's hard to think of what they might be, because in transfer pricing, the three 
things that you look at are the price, that is the, um, the interest rate, the amount of the loan, and, 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 and the fundamental question is whether it would take place at all um, in the absence of the special relationship, i.e. at arm's length. So although it recognises, I think it uses the word include, but I'm not sure what the other factors <coughs> would be. Um, because it's the fact, it, it, it is in reading section 1471B, the other factors you have to take into account. So you're deciding whether the fact, these are factors to take into account to decide whether the actual provision differs from the provision which would have been made between independent enterprises. So that the differences are either the interest rate would be different, the amount of loan would be different, or the transaction wouldn't take place at all. Well, I'm, I'm just throwing out, I mean, I, I'm just throwing out all that one, one sort of transaction might need underpinning or support from one direction and another might need it from another direction. That that might make a difference, or it might not make a difference. I mean, I'm just looking at this legislation for the first time. That, that's it's, not. It yeah, seems to, but I, um, to 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 point one towards uh, um, what's repeatedly been referred to as a real world look at this. But they're all they're all all of the what is said in subsection two one five two are all referring back to one four seven one d. That is to say. The, the actual provision differs from the arm's length provision which would be made between independent enterprises. So it, it's, it's, it's listing the ways in which it might differ. That, that's what it's doing. 1522 is listing, listing how it might differ. These are the ways that the, the provision might differ, but it's not telling you anything about the scope of the provision itself. That, that I think you have to get from 1471. And then there's subsection five, and, and my, my Lord, Lord Justice Nuji was asking, well, what's the point of that provision? <coughs> um, the, point, the point is this: um, what it's referring to is situations where there were there were actually guarantees are being given by, let's say, the um, top company in the group um, in relation to um, a loan. Now, without this provision, it would be very easy for groups to manipulate the result of the transfer pricing by giving or not giving guarantees. Because if the, the top company gives a guarantee to a, a lower company, which, which doesn't have as many assets, obviously, as this, uh, of its indebtedness, then essentially you're lending economically to the top company. And so you could, you could justify a higher amount of loan a lower interest rate, etc., um, and it's particularly important in relation to thin capitalisation arguments because it would mean that companies would be able to say, "Well, we don't need to put um, capital into this company, particularly because we've got a guarantee from a parent loan." So anyone would lend um, to this company if it's being guaranteed by the parent company of BlackRock. Um, they'd lend them. No billion with that guarantee. Uh, so that's the purpose of this provision: is to ensure that by introducing into the surrounding circumstances a guarantee by a third party, um, that you are not able to manipulate. Now, the reason it only applies to actual guarantees that are in existence is because those are the only ones I would submit that, that are assumed would be relevant. And the reason that they're relevant is not because they are part of the provision, but because they are part of the surrounding circumstances uh, of the, of the um, borrower company. Uh, I said initially, you have to take the borrower company as it is. You take both companies as they are. You have to take the borrower company as it is, in the group, and with the attributes that it has. Has in the real in the real world, the real controlled world, and so one of the attributes it would have, if a if a guarantee had been made, would be it would have the benefit of that guarantee. But that particular attribute is relates to the terms of that particular transaction. 
We're not necessarily postulating a guarantee that says you're guaranteed any debt you might incur. Well, you, 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 yeah, maybe, but you don't you know. Clear, but clearly, this yeah. provision is intended at situations that include a guarantee of that specific. Yes, exactly. So it's not a simple question of attributes. I no. I yeah. But what it doesn't apply to, most tellingly, is, is if you were able to imagine a guarantee in the hypothetical transaction, this wouldn't prevent that. As I say, all the real world practical agreement, including what is known as implicit support. Another friend mentioned implicit support. Implicit support is something which is taken into account in determining whether um, an independent lender would lend to a group company. And the experts in this case did take it into account. They took it into account in determining the credit scoring of the, of the LLC5. And you can see that as regards Mr. Ashley. Unfortunately, the, Mr. Gaysford's evidence, parts of it that are relevant are not in the bundle, but Mr. Ashley's are. It's in the supplementary bundle, tab 6, page 23. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll come back and I'll find the right record. There, there, there is a passage where he, he feeds it into his um, credit scoring analysis, but he still concludes that they wouldn't have a high enough credit scoring to, to be lent the money by an independent lender in, the, in his um, report. So I'll, I'll, I'll come back and I'll find the right record. Um, so what both experts focused on in this case um, was the problematic area that I've mentioned in the transaction, the lack of control by LLC5 of the LLC6. And they concluded that this, this could only be solved by covenants by other group companies so that dividends would be paid up to fund the interest. And we find this in the FTT decision where they made various findings of fact. Turn up the decision. We start paragraph 89 of the FTT decision. <coughs> so, paragraph 89, they make the finding that the transaction that was actually entered into would not have taken place in an arm's length transaction with an independent lender. Necessarily to hypothesize a different transaction which an independent lender would have entered into. And, and then, if you go to paragraph 96, um, Mr. Prosser relies on the other Mr. Ashley. However, while Mr. Ashley had experience of capital debt markets from which he could draw, as he recognized himself, like Mr. Gaysford, he did not have any experience of an independent enterprise making a $4 billion loan to a company like LLC5 held reference shares. Nevertheless, the experts agreed that an independent enterprise would be willing to loan $4 billion to LLC5, provided that the covenants, protection, and structural enhancements as described above and, um, can be put in place to ensure the guarantee of funds. 
i.e. the floor dividends from BGI to LLC6 <coughs> and from LLC6 to LLC5 via the preference shares for part of the company where it's possible to do so. And that is a reference to paragraph 90 of the decision. And perhaps you can see the various covenants that are set out in paragraph And then the conclusion of the tribunal, 103, for the reasons above, I find that although, although an independent enterprise would not have entered into the loan on the same terms as the actual transaction, it would, subject to the covenants described above, have entered into the loans on the same terms as the parties to the actual transaction. So again, referring to the covenants above. Now, there is a factual issue, which um, you've heard Mr. Prosser and Mr. Yates refer to, as to whether the tribunal were right um, in their, in their set, <coughs> sorry, what they said about the, the expert evidence, particularly Mr. Ashley's evidence, as to whether these covenants would be would be given um, at arm's length, um, and that's something that um, Ms. Chowdhury is going to address um, after I finished on transfer pricing. Um, one thing to, to appreciate is that a covenant which simply mirrored the preference share rights, that is to say the rights to have their dividends paid in preference to other dividends, uh, which is what LLC5 already had under the um, articles, um, would not have achieved anything. So that, I think those are my submissions on the point of um, construction. Um, and uh, if, unless there's any further questions on that, I was going to hand over to Ms. Chowdhury just to deal with the factual issue, and then I will come back on an allowable purpose after that. Thank you very much.
whether they would be provided. And the FTC reached its conclusion based on a misunderstanding of the evidence that was before it. And of course, yes, and, and this is um, an Edwards and Bezler argument. Nevertheless, we would submit that the high hurdle imposed by Edwards and Bezler is semantic. Um, you were taken yesterday to the parts of the FTC's decision in which set out the Edwards evidence. Um, it starts at paragraph 67 on page 184 of the core bundle and goes on to paragraph 73. And while the other tribunal does um, reproduce large parts of the FTC's decision, none of these paragraphs speak to you in it. Sorry, did you say 67 to 83? 73. Uh, just a preliminary point to start off. There were quite a few references yesterday to how Mr. Gaysford was an economist, whereas Mr. Ashley had experience on the capital markets. But as you've already heard, um, well, Mr. Ashley did make the point that he hadn't been part of any such transaction in his 30 years of experience. And so if you are going to be looking at <coughs> An economist will be someone quite suitable to give his opinion on that transaction. Um, but just to be clear, we're not relying on the argument about whether or not Mr. Gaysford's evidence ought to be preferred um, as opposed to Mr. Ashley's evidence, which I think is suggestive that that's where we're going to stop. That's, that was referred to before the Upper Tribunal Appeals that we're raising now. Um, but nevertheless, just to say, well, he's an economist. Somehow that in the lens of our evidence stays wrong. Um, I can deal with the paragraphs where it, um, the FTC dealt with the expert evidence quite briefly, as you saw yesterday. And you see in paragraph 70 sets out the covenants which Mr. Ashley had identified in his report. And as you'll be aware, it's covenant number two, which we say is the crucial one. Um, if you want to know where these come from, that's um, paragraph 5.12 of Mr. Ashley's report, which is on page 123 of the supplementary bundle. Um, you don't need to turn them up, save for the fact that you see a reference in the transcript to um, them being known as tools. That's not how we refer to them in the <coughs> That's the point which picked up then in his oral evidence. And then paragraph 73 sets out the covenants um, which Mr. Gaysford has referred to in his report. As being necessary. And again, we only need to look at A. Um, now, Mr. Gaysford had set out three different versions of the arms length transaction in his report, one of which he referred to as the wider transaction, which would have included a letter of support or parent company guarantee and the covenants from Ulta and the group to ensure the flows to LLC 5. And so that's where, and again, that's um, if you want the reference to where you find this particular passage in his report, it's paragraph 348, page 104 of the supplementary bundle. The, uh, the other document before we got to the oral evidence of the experts before the FTC was the unagreed joint statements, which unfortunately agreed on this particular point, and you saw those yesterday in paragraphs F and D in particular, which are set out in paragraph. They were agreed on that particular point. They were agreed on that particular point. The, the point on which they were not agreed was a point which Mr. Gaysford considered he ought to cover as a matter of his instructions, but which Mr. Ashley said he did not consider it in his opinion. And that's referred to by the FTC at paragraph 76. Um, the full quote from the joint statements in both versions just includes a sentence that they both broadly agreed with the first question their instructions, namely would LLC5 and an independent enterprise have entered into the loan in the same terms and in the same amount. And we looked at F yesterday, it's on page 187 of the core bundle. And as we know, this is again, it's about the issue of dividends. And it says there that they were agreed you needed a covenant. That independent leader would need a covenant in relation to the dividend flow. But it 
it's only in their oral evidence that became clear that they were understanding this thing in a rather different term. And for that, we do need to go to the transcript. We're starting with Mr. Ashley's evidence, which we didn't look at yesterday. So this is the supplementary bundle, page 199. <coughs> Mr. Ashley. 
So just before, I'm, I'm sorry, I know we're moving around to speed. But the, the, the critical point for you is the issue of um, compellable obligation to pay dividends. Yeah, yes, it is. Right. Now, we last hit that. I think we only hit that at page 203, internal page 45. Yes, so uh, in relation to Mr. Ashley. <laughs> In relation to Mr. Ashley, that's yes, right. Yes, so that's his, last, that's right. his final answer. <coughs> He's thought about it. There's, there's been quite a lot of cross-examination on this point. He's gone away to just say, can I clarify, this is what I think that this argument would be. And when he's asked, is, it, is there any element of having been compelled to pay a dividend, so his answer is quite clearly no. And that's where he ends up. Because I, I think I did refer you to, uh, earlier on, he does seem to say, well, we could have removed the discretion. But then he moves away from Right, but, but you're, you're saying it's his final answer. It's one passage of question and answer within a very long well, passage of, um, of, of, of evidence. Um, broadly, so uh, I think in the long passage of evidence, more or less it's consistent that his, his understanding of this covenant was that it would be something which would be, uh, that would require the dividends to be paid first. At one point, he seemed to suggest you would actually remove the discretion that was going to be given. And then he goes away, thinks about says, well, no, that's not right. Don't, I don't, as far as I understand, you couldn't have a dividend, you couldn't have a covenant which would compel payment of a dividend. Okay. So um, we do need to see the entire package yeah. to see that there is some swing and throwing on it, but that's where he ends up. Your, your, point, your point then is, well, that claim is in preference. Right? Yes, exactly. It's something that could be discussed. But at no stage, it, uh, you haven't put to Mr. Mr. Ashley, um, that he's saying this covenant, whatever it is, was critical. That's what his evidence was. Yes. He doesn't withdraw that. No, he doesn't. No. But when you ask him what exactly is this covenant, mm. the answer we get back is that LLC5 receives dividends first. Yes. But that in the form of a contractual covenant might give different protection to something in share rules. I'm just saying this is this hasn't been explored, but we do have uncontroversial evidence that he thought that that covenant was critical. So I'm not sure it's quite as. I understand your argument, yes. but I think there's a bit more to it. Right. So he says it's critical, and I, I think it helps when we see more what Mr. Gaysford says. Yes. When it's put to him, mm. because he says it's critical, and then you go, well, what's exactly? What are you talking? What is critical? Because clearly it's something which both experts. He says, well, as long as they're paid first, in priority. And to which you then go to Mr. Gaysford and say, well, that's what you've heard. Is that enough? And his answer is, no, it isn't. And he's quite consistent on that all the way through. And the reason, and I think this comes back to the point which is made by BlackRock as well, well, does all of this matter? All very interesting. The experts don't quite agree. And the answer is, it does matter. Because the FTT, when it looks at all this evidence, says, and the experts were agreed on the nature of the covenant. But they're not, because Mr. Gaysford, in his evidence, is clear all the way through that it has to be something which requires payment of the dividend, not just that the dividend will be paid first. They ensures the flow up from LLC6 to LLC5 so it can meet its interest payment under the loan. Sorry, I interrupted you. Do you want to take us to the, um, yes, to the so best point of Mr. Gaysford? Yes, yeah, so, and so I can do this again quite quickly because we saw some of this yesterday. So it was page 209 and internal page 70 um, where he's asked the question of paragraph at line 15. <coughs> and at the very top of the next says, I don't think it would be sufficient to have a preferential covenant. <coughs> and again, he's asked about he's asked this um, more than once. <coughs> um, even at the bottom of page 72, the question is, could you 
slightly different tone. And over the page, page 210, at the very top again, he says, I don't think it's in condition. And I missed out the section in between um, on page 72, where Broadly explains the reason it's not sufficient um, is that there isn't enough of a penalty for LP2. So they did not instruct LP6 to pay anything. Um, and the point, the broad point I make in relation to Mr. Gaysford's evidence is that his view does not change all the way through. His view is that that's, it's not enough to have a covenant that just says you get your dividends first. He, he considers it needs to be something more. And the other point which doesn't really change is he does say, and it's in his report, is that looking at it from the group's perspective, while an independent lender would require such a payment, the group would not provide it. And you've seen some reference to the point about it being too costly and complex, which I wanted, but that's where it comes up in this particular article. But yes, that's what the lender wants, but the borrower or the group, more precisely, wouldn't provide it. Sorry, can you point us to where he says this? Not that. In his report. Um, we, well, we don't have his entire report, but we do have his summary of conclusions on page 92 of the supplementary binding. And in particular, it's paragraph 46C, where he describes the wider transaction, which is um, the transaction in respect to which he discusses the covenant.
very not to consider various factors that deal with it. So what is that? What are you <laughs> saying on that? Now, do you see the first mention of the on this page, um, on internal page 80? Um, when he's saying, when he's asked about, well, you talk about it being costly and complex, and this is for black objects to enter, right? So There are more questions on this page, on the following page. Um, I don't need to take you through all of them. But when he's asked, for instance, whether something's a deal breaker, he comes back with the answer that it's no deal incentive. I'll take you through that in a second. But just again at the bottom of page 83, on line, we're starting at line 16, internal page 83. I mean, just, just to emphasize, that's another point where he's talking about how you need to effectively put more certainty around the dividend flow. Mr. Ashley was not agreeing with the such covenants as 
say the FTC does make an effort. It's a clear effort. If anything, the experts actually agreed that you wouldn't have a covenant which compelled the payment of dividends. Mr. Ashley, because as far as he was aware, it was not possible to have such a covenant. Mr. Gaysford, because it would not be commercially rational. Mr. 72 recalled to Mr. Ashley, I just want to point out, 72 recalled Mr. Ashley's evidence about the nature of the covenant. Yes, indeed. And that's the point which you see that he confirmed there was nothing more to the covenant. But he is asked to clarify the covenant. Thank you. That is why we say that the FTC did make an error in its assessment of the evidence. And in particular, the oral evidence of both experts as to how they understood what they understood the necessary covenant to be. And in particular, we would say it goes beyond saying, well, there was a covenant and they weren't quite agreed on the precise terms and it doesn't matter. And that's almost because that's all that's leaving us. That's all that's taking any sort of general statement that says, well, you can have a payment of expenses. As a general statement, that's correct. It's only when you consider what those expenses actually are that you know whether or not payment of expenses, sorry, that you can have a payment of expenses which is deductible for tax purposes, but you need to consider what those actual expenses are to determine whether or not they are really deductible. So again, just taking the metaphor as far as it can possibly go, we're not arguing here about shades of purple. There is a clear difference between the two experts. But notwithstanding that, the FTC considered that they were agreed. And this reference to agreement is taken from 72. Yes, and then it comes back into where the FTC takes its conclusion on the transfer price issue on page 192. And paragraph 101 is talking about the two transactions, the actual transaction and the hypothetical transaction. And then paragraph 102, both experts agreed an independent lender would have entered into arrangements subject to being able to obtain the necessary covenants. But there's no agreement on the nature of the covenants. And then there's another error when it says, on balance given that Mr. Gaysford accepted his concerns in relation to property complexity did not amount to deal breaking. Now again, at most he objected to the use of the term. But when he said, I don't think this is a deal breaker, he didn't mean, I think the deal would go ahead. His point was, the deal won't go ahead because it's not commercially rational. And that better commercial alternative is a better fit. And so this does form part of the FTC's conclusion on the transfer pricing issue. And that's why I say it matters and why we're raising the argument again. But of course, this is an appeal from the upper tribunal's decision. And when it comes to seeing why the upper tribunal rejected this argument, the short answer is it's not entirely clear. Let 
this at 79 and onwards, is it? Um, in the other tribunal, <coughs> yes. I was actually going to start off on page 94 when we have the transfer pricing issue, just to make the point that there's quite a lot, there's a very long discussion of the transfer pricing issue, but there's no reference in that section to paragraph 74. And as uh, my lord, you say, you see, it does start off on page 79 and paragraph 106, and it's basically 10 paragraphs. And, and of those 10 paragraphs, you just get the FTT's, uh, sorry, the upper tribunal's conclusion, paragraph 82, where it rather boldly states, we're not satisfied the FTT did mischaracterize the evidence in this case with. And just. Well, it's not. You know, you said boldly stated, it gets boldly stated and then followed up by. Quite a head of hair afterwards. Um, I mean, was that um, several dense paragraphs well, they going are, through all the sorts of things that you've been telling us? They are, they are the things I've been telling you. It sets up all the paragraphs, and then in the end, it comes back to. I'm not sure if I want to take that metaphor any further, but another statement at paragraph 88, where it just says, and therefore it did not, get, uh, and therefore it did not mischaracterize the effect of the evidence. Well, I, I, all right, I, I appreciate. You, you say that they may be wrong, um, yes. but um, I'm not sure they're going to go down because of lack of reasoning. Well, unless there's more to say about that. Well, well as far, I'm not saying that it's lack of reasoning, I'm just saying it's very short reasoning, and it's in, not entirely clear what the extent of the actual engagement has been. I do make the point out of 202 paragraphs, it's got within 10 paragraphs. Not surprising, there are much bigger issues at play in this. Nevertheless, you do consider it an important point, and that's why it is raised by the defendant. Thank you very much, Mr. Chaudhry. Yes. First of all, find the reference that I was looking for. Um, it's actually page 123. Sorry about that. In the oh. supplementary bundle, line tab 5. I don't know if you need to turn it up, but you'll see there um, in paragraphs. It actually starts, actually, you could start with 122, paragraph 5.7. They discuss the, uh, he discusses the um, <coughs> implicit support says that he, has, he was taken into account in 5.10 in the rating. However, that still didn't get him high enough to um, justify the transaction. That's, that's the but My only point is that it, it, it was taken account of in this case by the experts. <coughs> quite, quite rightly. The implicit support <coughs> being membership of that larger of the group, group. yes, exactly. It's well recognised concept in transfer pricing. You take account of implicit support that um, third Sorry, party. This is will. Mr. Ashley's report. That's Mr. Ashley's report. Thank you. Sorry. As I say, that Mr. Gaysford also took account of it. We don't have. We've only got the summary of his report in. Can I just make a small point on that, which I, I, I intended to take you to um, in the, in the um, transfer pricing, pricing guidance? <coughs> this is in the context of Mr. Gaysford's approach, which you've just heard being described, um, because this is exactly the approach that the transfer pricing guidance says is um, one that you should adopt. This is on page 925 and 926 of the authority file. Paragraph 10, 19. Independent enterprises, when considering whether to enter into a particular financial transaction, will consider all other options realistically available to them and will only enter into the transaction if they see no alternative 
that offers a clearly more attractive opportunity to meet the national objectives. Considering the options realistically available, the perspective of each of the parties to transaction must be considered. Well, this is the 2022. This is the 2022 guidance. Yeah, I accept that. But it's a it's a general approach that is adopted in transfer pricing. I also wanted to come back, Malini, just to the question of the guarantee and our discussion of that. Um, because the, the, I think you, you raised the point that there would be a guarantee of the actual transaction. Um, if there was a guarantee given by the top company of the group. Mm. Of course, that's correct. But that, that point is, there would be a guarantee in the actual control transaction. And, and the circumstances of the actual control transaction are circumstances that you have to take into account in the hypothetical uncontrolled transaction because it has to be the same party LLC by in the same let's say in this case in the same position. So that's why you take it into an actual guarantee. You would take it into account apart from one five two subsection five. <coughs> um, And that brings me on to the difference between actual covenants being given in the transaction and hypothetical covenants. Because it is said, well, this doesn't, this is a nonsense because all they have to do is give covenants in the um, hypothetical transaction, um, sorry, in the real transaction, the real control transaction, and then they would have to be taken into account in the uncontrolled transaction, which is true. But of course, there is a big difference for a number of reasons between a real covenant um, and, a, and a hypothetical covenant, which is what is being argued for here. The first in relation to transfer pricing is that the actual covenant would have to be transfer priced itself because it would be a provision between between parties but not at arm's length. So it would, be, it would be subject, if it was a real covenant, an actual covenant in the actual transaction, it would be subject to the transfer pricing provision. No, I, I understand that. But, but how does that impact the analysis of this? It wouldn't. I'm, I'm making a more general point, which is that it isn't. It isn't the same. Uh, the consequences are not at all the same of having a real covenant in a real transaction as having a hypothetical covenant. And I, I'm just going through the various differences. One is that it would, it would be subject to transfer pricing, whereas a hypothetical covenant. Is not subject to transfer pricing. It can can be, um, which is why we say one of the reasons we say it can't exist. But also, they would have all sorts of other consequences. And these covenants could have consequences, regulatory, tax consequences in, in other jurisdictions. It might have consequences in the US. So you can't simply say blandly, "This would be an easy thing to just um, get around the, the problem if there is a problem." And of course, it only arises in this particular very, very peculiar kind of case um, where um, the company doesn't have control of its subsidiaries. So it's, it's, not, it's, not a big, um, it's not a big issue generally. And then, <coughs> and then it's on to unlevel purpose. Start by saying something about about purpose. What is what is being referred to when they're talking about purpose? And it's referring. I think it's clear from the meaning of the word and the authorities. It's referring to the object or intention with which a person enters into the transaction. In this case, it is the one relationship that's being referred to. Or put another way, what what the person is trying to achieve in entering into the transaction. But it's not necessarily synonymous with the matters which justify the party in entering into the transaction. In particular, in this case, the matters which justify the directors of LLC um, 5 in approving the transaction. Rather, it's not, it's not limited. 
that's clear to the expressed motive or objects of the person who's related to them. However, in this case, we would say, looking at the evidence and the finding, there was no expressed motive or object at all. Except in the sense that you can determine from the background um, act. I mean by that there was no express motive by the directors of LLC 5 and Digging on Collision. There was clearly a lot of express motive and object before that. Now, the, the three important cases on purpose, and then our friends refer to them, and I, I would just like to to take you to them, it's Malcolm <coughs> Drummond, McKinley, and, and Vodafone. What, <coughs> what they demonstrate in my submission is that the purposes of a person or, or a group of persons, in McKinley it was a group of persons, I think, are not limited to the matters which they take into account in deciding to affect the transaction. So if we take up Malaview, that's in um, Authorities Bundle 1, tab 7. The facts are um, well known and fairly straightforward. Are you, can I just clarify, you're effectively dealing with one arm is your respondent's motives in the course of these submissions, are you? One element of the respondent's motives is that the FTP was wrong. Exactly. And the FTP was wrong. That, that's I'm, I'm, wrapped into this. Exactly. Oh, I'm trying to explain okay. how we see yeah. purpose operating, mm. and we say that the F, exactly the FTP was right. We say. So this is your respondent's notice point three. Yes. It's being wrapped into this. Yes, exactly. Because we do say fundamentally the FTT was right. And of course we are primarily looking at the FTT because it, it made a finding uh, of, of tax avoidance purpose. And we say that it didn't err in law at all in making that finding. Um, so the... Um, <coughs> the basis on which this case was argued from the, the courts was the, the findings by the commissioners and, and that's set out on page 161 <coughs> of the report which is actually in the dissenting speech of Lord Elwyn Jones where he says at the bottom of page 161 just above H the commissioners did look into the appellant's mind brackets as far as humans can look into the minds of others and found that when Miss Ballyu laid out money on clothes for wearing in court, her purpose in making that expenditure was to enable her to earn profits in her profession and also to enable her to be properly clothed during the time she was, a, <coughs> she was on her way to chamber or to court and while she was engaged in a professional activity. So that, that, that was the findings as to why, why Miss Ballyu bought the clothes in question. Now, there, there, there's discussion in this case about unconscious purpose and can become rather a, a metaphysical or neurological argument but one thing that's perfectly clear is that Miss Malaview knew that clothes provided warmth and decency no one's suggesting she didn't know that what happened in this case was she said and was believed by the uh, general commissioner sorry yes but the general commissioner she said that wasn't a, essentially that was not a factor I took into account in deciding to buy these clothes the factors I took into account which were sufficient for me to buy these clothes were that I needed them for court and my professional activity what the House of Lords said is that is not complete answer to your to the purpose well, of the acquisition. She, she lost before the, the commissioners. She, she lost before the commissioners, yes. Yeah. And the, but the High Court said on the basis of that finding okay. she should have won. So I think she won in the High Court and the Court of Appeal yeah. 
on that basis. I, I've not quite understood that because the evidence that Lord Elwyn Jones, sorry, the finding that Lord Elwyn Jones refers to, says that she has two purposes. One is to enable her to earn profits, and the other is to enable her to be properly clothed. But I think it was properly clothed in in her professional activities as well. During the time she was oh, on I her see. way to During... chambers or to court. Yes. Yes, exactly. So it's hiding so, that off. She was. She said, "I bought these because the fact that what I took into account is I needed these in order to go to court to be in chambers to be properly dressed professionally." Um, oh, I see. That's what she was saying, and no doubt that was true. That was why that was the factor she took into account in her find in deciding to buy them clothes. The, so the commissioners have said essentially you did have. They picked up one way or another. They yes, I'm, I'm, yeah. point. well, I'm not sure they put it quite like that, but they, yes, they did. Um, somehow they came to that conclusion. Um, but we but haven't got their decision. No, we don't, unfortunately. I, don't. <coughs> I do often lobby for the tax cases reports to put in, but nobody listens to me. Um, we would have had it then. So. I think you find it actually in the judgment or the speech of Lord Brighton. Oh, is it? Um, on, not all of it, but on page 166. Thank you. Oh. Halfway down. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I do seem to be making a similar point about what we cladding. But the, the point was that the High Court took the view and the Court of Appeal that all you should look at is, is, is what she was, what she, um, what factors she took into account to sell, deciding to buy the clothes. That's what they thought was the right approach. And the House of Lords said, no, that, that's wrong. And on page 169, um, you can see that set out at the bottom, the top of the page, where he describes the Lord Justice, uh, Mr. Justice Slade felt driven to answer the question in favour of the taxpayer because he felt constrained by the Commission's findings that, in effect, the only object present in the mind of the taxpayer was the requirements of a profession. The conscious motive was decisive. And then he goes on to say, My Lords, I find myself totally unable to accept this narrow approach. Of course, Miss Malvin you felt only the requirements of a profession when she first bought her wardrobe of subdued clothing. And no doubt, as and when she replaced items or sent to the laundries or cleaners, she would have asked and repeated that she was maintaining her wardrobe because of those requirements. The natural way anyone incurring expenditure would think and speak. And he goes on to make the point she needed clothes to travel to work, to wear at work. It's inescapable that one object, though not the conscious motive, was the provision of the clothing that she needed as a human being. Now, I, I, I say it's a bit strange to be talking about conscious and unconscious because really, question is what was she taking account of at the time? No one can know what she was thinking um, and, and, and what, what thoughts go through people's minds. And we'll come back to that when we look at the look at the board meeting in this case. It's not possible to say tax considerations were not in their minds. What you can say is that they didn't take them into account in coming to the decision to um, to enter into a loan relationship. So that's Malaview. And then perhaps a slightly more um, closer case is McKinley, which is behind tab 8. <coughs> this was about the removal expenses paid to partners who were required by the partnership to move. And the question whether that was deductible <coughs> and computing the profits of the partnership. And the um, the committee of the partnership who decided on the payments took into account only business purposes, as you might expect, in deciding to make the payments. But the, 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 the partners were being required to move for the purposes of the business. And that, that's why 
the partner committee was able to take the decision to make payments to them. But that was held not to be the only purpose, the only purposes. And if I can just pick it up at page 188. Uh, just about letter F. The Lordships have been referred to what may be regarded as a seminal decision of this House in Mallory and Drummond, and much argument has been addressed to the question whether the purpose of the particular payment falls to be ascertained objectively or by reference only to the subjective intention of the payer. For my part, I think the difficulties suggested here are more illusory than real. But that's interesting that he didn't think it really mattered whether it was objective or subjective. The question in each case is what was the object to be served by the disbursement of expense? As was pointed out by Lord Brighton in Malu's case, this cannot be answered by simply by evidence of what the payer says he intended to achieve. So in this case, the, 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 the partner committee was saying that they intended to achieve the business purposes of the partnership in um, encouraging the partners to move where they wanted them to move somewhere else to work. Um, some results are so inevitably and inextricably involved in a particular activity that they cannot but be said to be a purpose of the activity. This malleus restrained the sober garb inevitably served and cannot but have been intended to serve the purpose <coughs> of preserving warmth and decency. And her purpose in buying them cannot have been at least in part to serve that purpose, whether she consciously thought about it or not. So here the payment of estate agents fees, conveyancing costs and so on, the provision of carpets and curtains cannot but have been intended to serve the purpose of establishing a comfortable and private home for the partner concerned, even though his motive in establishing a home in that particular place was to assist in furthering the partnership interests. Nobody could say with any colour of conviction that in purchasing new curtains, he or his wife were acting over partnership business. In my judgment, once one escapes from what I regard as the fallacy of confusing the purpose of the expenditure with the motives of the members of the executive committee and inferentially of the other partners in resolving to reimburse the expenditure, the case presents very little difficulty and is indeed a much clearer and easier case than Mallory and Drummond. So, although again, no doubt the um, executive committee members appreciated that, that, that what they were doing would have the benefits that are set out for the House of Lords. They would not be stupid. They would understand that. What they were saying was, well, we didn't take that into account in, 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 in coming to our decision. What we decided was on the basis of, on the basis of the benefits of the partnership alone, the business purposes. The House of Lords said, no, your purpose is wider, it could be wider than that. And in this case, it, it was wider than that. <coughs> now, my learned friend says, well, this, <coughs> this is all concerned with personal benefits somehow. Uh, it doesn't apply more generally. Um, my submission is it, it is a general proposition. It's <coughs> in, in no way limited in either of these cases to personal benefit. <coughs> but, but that's made doubly clear in my submission by Vodafone Cellular, which I think my other friend did take you to, um, which is behind. <coughs> now this was a case which concerned companies. There was no personal factors involved in this case. Um, it, it was a payment um, to get out of a, a remove a an onerous um, contract or something which was paid by the parent company which had two subsidiaries which were also involved in the same activity <coughs> and the question was whether it was paid only for the purposes of the trade of the parent company who made the payment or whether it was also made for the purposes of the trades of the subsidiary So this was not a case about personal benefits or carpets or curtains or barristers' clothes. But quite rightly in this case, the Court of Appeal, it's Lord Justice Millett, setting out the principles on page 198, included in number four, just letter H, although the taxpayer's subjective intention is determinative, they are not limited to the conscious motives which were in mind at the time of the payment. Some consequences are so inevitably and inextricably involved in the payment that unless merely incidental, they must be taken to a purpose for which the payment was made. 
So my, in my submission, I was recognising that this was a Czech prin principle of general. Sorry, what part were you reading there? You were reading I'm sorry, four. Page, page 198, letter H. Right, well, would it help to start a little bit higher where the sidelining begins? Yes, certainly. If you, if you want to read the entire paragraph, these are the, these are the various principles he's summarising from the cases. He does refer there, you, you'll see in um, <coughs> little 2, just above G, to save obvious cases which speak for themselves. I think that's, that's echoing something that was said by Lord Brightman in Mal Ewan Drummond. So there are, in obvious cases, you don't have to look into the mind. It's there. You can see it from the circumstances. So we say that, properly understood, these cases are essentially saying that one, contrary to what the taxpayers are arguing in this case, that you do not limit yourself in deciding what the purpose of a transaction is, in this case entering into a loan relationship. You don't limit yourself to the factors that the taxpayer took into account in being able to enter into the transaction. In, in justifying himself or itself in entering into the transaction. <clears throat> now we say that the, the first tier tribunal got this absolutely right. And it certainly didn't make any error of law. Um, can we turn to the um, FTT decision? Start with the background facts because the, the uh, I am noticing the time, but the, F, the FTT. Well, I, I take take your own course. Yeah. Do you want to? I mean, you go from the FTT to the UT, presumably. Um, yes. Yeah. Would you rather do that in one? That might be better. All right. Yes. Well, we'll we'll have a slightly early break then, and um, and start again with that at two o'clock. Thank you. All right.